Thank you, Polly. Um, probably the world's most boring subject, I'm afraid, traffic engineering. Uh, the ex exits are there and there, if you want to run, <laughs> as you said. Um, just by way of background, I'm a recovering architect by, by training, but, I, but I've been fascinated. I wanted a career, something that was enjoyable, so I, I hang around street corners watching the girls go by, trying to think of better ways to design streets. And in doing so, I've just found myself having to bridge a huge gulf, in the way we think, between the relationship between urban issues, uh, how we make cities successful and economically vital, and the whole world, strange to me, world of traffic engineering and risk and, and safety. And this has brought me into understanding new, or researching, not understanding, it's a, I have only a beginner in this area, uh, certain aspects of behavioral psychology and the way in which people respond to themselves, surroundings and traffic and the relationship that government has to that. I wanted to start just some ob uh, 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 very mundane observations. This is my front door. Uh, I live in Bristol, a rather old house, and it's got a letterbox uh, like many houses have. You'll notice that this one was installed a long time ago. So early uh, was the technology of, of postings that the, the designers had to put the instructions on the front to tell you how to use it. I don't know what else it might have been for, a <laughs> bat flap or something, but um, uh, within a few years of its installation, letterboxes were installed all in all the other houses down the street without instructions on them. People had learned how to use a letterbox quite quickly, and we no longer need to tell people the purpose of, the, of a letterbox. But it's interesting how, how, it's such, mate, how quickly, uh, what an intelligent species we are, and how quickly we adopt to our surroundings. I also want to... Um, draw an example of the, um, <clears throat> one of my favorite sort of places, an ice skating rink. Now, most of you, I suspect, have had the pleasure in your life of either uh, participating in an ice skating rink or at least watching one. And uh, if you, but if, if you could imagine for a moment you've never experienced one in your life, and you, uh, entrepreneur, you came to a local authority to suggest putting one up for Christmas or whatever in the town, and they, you had to explain that you flood an area with about the size of top, of top of tennis courts with ice, and uh, people are uh, strapped steel blades onto their boots, and, and off they go. There's no other rules or control. I think most local authorities would say, you must be joking. I mean, how are people not going to bump into each other? You've got a whole lot of people sliding around on ice, uh, beginners and uh, experts and so on. You'd have to organize and regulate this. Now, of course, we know from experience that part of the pleasure of using an ice rink is that you engage in an extraordinary complex process of coordination and anticipation with a whole bunch of strangers, out of which emerge all sorts of social protocols about where you go and how you behave and so on, without anybody having to be told how to do this. And ice, skates, ice skating rinks and the like <coughs> fascinate me because they're full of the difference, they illustrate the difference between the assumptions that we make about what is necessary in life and observations about human behavior. And indeed, most of the stuff that we litter our streets with and on which we spend a huge amount of money are based on a series of assumptions about what is necessary in order to uh, regulate and order our public realm. This uh, a, a place on the edge of Kew Bridge in, uh, in, in West London. Um, is, is, is uh, clearly a very expensive place. There's all sorts of very expensive kit there, all based on the assumption that it's necessary in order to resolve the complex movements of people and vehicles and so forth. Um, it's also, of course, a very articulate space. The, uh, the former forecourt of that rather handsome, once rather handsome pub in the background has been subsumed into other, other higher priorities about, about movement. Streets, of course, are, are interesting places. Uh, when I grew up, streets weren't considered very important. If I said I was a street designer 20 years ago, people would have been a bit puzzled by that. So to go back to a, a very boring street, but one that for my generation is extremely uh, evocative, but, but um, remembering that if you remove the old ears from the foreground for a moment, um, most of us assume the streets are, are two lines of opposing traffic separated by a broken white line. There'll be a line of parallel parking both sides, um, maybe a four or five inch upstand curb, which separates the pedestrian area from the traffic area and clearly define spaces where you're meant to cross the road, which the, the Fab Four are dutifully doing. Now, since the heady days of the 60s, we, we have been beginning to realize that streets are indeed hugely important spaces, important for economic reasons as well as for, uh, for social reasons, and that this has seen in the last 10 years enormous uh, efforts by uh, highway authorities and local authorities, generally uh, developers and communities, to 
uh, rethink the relationship with the, the role of their streets simply because town centres have become redundant. We don't need them anymore. It, 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 a generation ago, you had to participate in the marketplace of your town, whether you liked it or not, in order to obtain the goods and services you need. Now, for the first time ever in human history, you can, if you so wish, get all of your goods and services from out of town <coughs> superstores or via the internet. You can even keep your social relationships through the internet. There's no functional necessity to co congregate in towns. We will continue to do so because we enjoy it, because it fulfills other human desires for interaction. But this change from being uh, towns being functional channels for the movement and distribution of goods and services to being places that are by definition enjoyable has huge implications for the public realm and therefore the streets that, that make up. So we've seen over the last few years a lot of work, particularly in mainland Europe, rethinking the role of streets and particularly the relationship with traffic that are between people and, and, and drivers and, and movement. For most of the time, most of our streets have become places that are simply the, the recipients of layer upon layer of regulatory devices, each put in, no doubt, for good reasons at the time, but uh, perhaps I'm unkind with the cartoon, but I'm sure you can associate with places that have some of those characteristics. But of course, they are essentially non-places. They're places that are essentially um, attempting to be sewers in the same way of you can efficient movement of of solids or, or, or fluid uh, through the city without any other purpose. And this difference between what makes our cities and what we feel important has always puzzled me because we've learned in the last 30 years that the value of wonderful buildings like this uh, is worth spending a lot of money to preserve and yet we treat other aspects of our built environment rather strangely. Let me illustrate this by imagining some nice um, building, a town hall or a library, um, some nice town, and it's midnight and some little hoodie um, a vandal, you know, what, 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 <coughs> turns up with his spray can. <coughs> the little shit turns up and, and sprays the front of this building with paint. They do that sometimes, I don't know why. And uh, fortunately, the police turn up and nick him, but not before, sadly, he's very badly damaged this nice building. And the poor citizens wake up in the morning to discover that their handsome uh, building has been badly damaged. And there's much concern and outrage, and the press uh, quick off the mark and so on. Fortunately, in this case, the local authority, the uh, highway authority, are extremely efficient and quick to uh, start to repair the damage and clean up and carry on the business of responsible government as usual. <laughs> um, it, it's, it always struck me as very strange that we have this strange schism, that the, as I go around the place looking at the immediate space between my feet, isn't that wonderful, the bottom left, this is from, uh, from a South Wales town, I think it's almost, almost worth an art gallery, that one. But of course, uh, most public concern about our, the state of our streets is about the degree of clutter. See Eric Pickles recently. And indeed, you know, the overload of information is a, is a problem. If it gets, gets you down too much, it's always nice to know, second from top, there's someone to turn to. But um, <laughs> of course, the, the issue of clutter is, is much more about than, than merely um, an aesthetic issue. Uh, it's also, of course, that the public, our public realms, like our living rooms, are highly articulate about us. We use our living rooms to say lots and communicate about who we are and, and, and what we, our values are. And if you walk into somebody's living room, you learn instantly a huge amount about who they are and what their beliefs are and, and whether it's appropriate to smoke or not or, or make a loud, loud noise or, 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 or what. And, and the way we treat our streets is exactly the same. The reason we enjoy traveling and tourism and going to city breaks and seeing places is because we can read the value systems and the beliefs of a, of a community in a place remarkably quickly. And in my job, which involves uh, living on trains, and visiting town after town after town and advising local authorities on their streets, usually I find within five minutes of the railway station, there are a million little clues that tell you huge <laughs> volumes about the value systems of this place. <laughs> Forgive me, Torbay, but I, I couldn't resist that, that one. Now, for, for, for most of us, the, 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 the problems of traffic and, uh, are, are a major obsession to many communities, um, whether they're small hamlets or, or larger towns. And for most communities, the only um, way they feel they can respond to defense of place is to get down on their hands and knees to their highway authority <coughs> and ask and beg and cajole them to spend lots of money um, providing them with some defensive signage and information to, to try and keep their, the, the, the traffic at bay. And indeed, the way that the state communicates behavior, appropriate behavior with drivers and so on, is always 
intrigue me. I, I don't know about you, but I find when I look at most parking signs, I realise I'm very, very stupid because I can't get my brain around them. I just don't understand them at all. And I, I, I'm not sure that I'm the only person who doesn't, but all of them, of course, are, are, are prescribed. And, and for these, is this the world's most boring book on the left here? But possibly the most important one that, that, that influences the experience that you have every day of your life as you walk down the street. It's called the Traffic Signs Regulation and General Directions Order. And I don't recommend it if you're, unless you're a severe insomniac. But um, it's an incredibly important book. It's referred to as most traffic engineers as the Bible. Uh, interesting relationship with religion, but um, all of these signs and so on that we use emerge from this. I was intrigued by this and, and, and prompted by a, a friend of mine who was a Reuters journalist who returned from uh, a 10 year stint in Singapore where he handles very complex financial data and interprets it for his clients. He said, is it just me or am I gone stupid? I've gone back to London and I can't understand the parking, what, what the state is trying to tell me with the, all these yellow and red signs. I don't understand it. So I said, well, I'll have a look at the book and I'll tell you what they mean. See if you agree with me. There's single yellow lines, there's double yellow lines, there's even triple yellow lines. There's other versions of this, of course. Interestingly, I've discovered there's a class aspect to yellow lines. I don't know whether you know this. In nice conservation uh, smart uh, areas, you're allowed to use plimbos, uh, which I think mean this. It would be so frightfully good as not to buy <laughs> so much. <laughs> At the other end of the social spectrum, there's even a version for bus drivers, um, uh, which, which is a double, double yellow line. There are red versions and so on. I mean, they, they go on and on and on. But of course, there's a means to, for the state to communicate behavioral change. They're a remarkably crude and clumsy and often, as we know, very ineffective way to influence change. So now, now, streets have always been complicated places. They have to serve a variety of functions, principally those of movement on the one hand, uh, transport, traffic, and on the other hand of exchange, interaction, uh, trade, um, uh, people uh, conversing one with another. And I like old images like this one of Brighton in 1830 because they so well illustrate the, 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 um, the, the way those two functions have historically interacted. And indeed, if you look more recently, this is a market high street in 1961, and whilst by then there's quite a lot of vehicles using that street, there's still, uh, you can sense, a pretty informal mixing of those two functions. You don't feel that rather formidable woman in the bottom right is in the wrong place. And you wouldn't argue with, with her if you did, but I suspect. But, but, um, but um, it, 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 the, the streets adapted to the particular circumstances. And indeed, to this day, you don't have to go very far around the world to find many, many streets that still loosely uh, adapt to their particular circumstances. 